This week, the taxi industry reached a landmark settlement with Uber. The ride-sharing giant has agreed to pay $272 million in compensation after a five-year legal battle with taxi and hire car operators. Uber was due to face court this week, and they were accused of operating unlawfully when it first launched in Australia. But those legal proceedings are now not going to go ahead. Can you take me through the settlement? That's right. So after five years of legal proceedings, more than 8,000 taxi and hire car operators, they will receive a share of $272 million wow. after reaching a historic settlement with Uber. It's the first time ever that Uber has reached this kind of a deal with any taxi industry anywhere, and it's one of the largest class action settlements in Australian history. So if we go back to the beginning of those proceedings five years ago, what was the original accusation against Uber? So first of all, as I mentioned, this is a class action and that's a type of lawsuit where many people are represented by one entity. So in this case, that entity is a legal firm called Morris Blackburn. This all started in 2019 with one cabbie, a Victorian taxi driver, and his name is Nikos Adrianakis, and he filed a proceeding against Uber in the Victorian Supreme Court in 2019. Then Morris Blackburn got more than 8,000 thousand signups from other taxi drivers, other people working in the taxi and hire car industry who wanted to be part of this case. So what was he arguing? So the argument centered around that Uber launched its ride sharing service UberX illegally in 2014. And this was in four states. So Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland and WA. And this Victorian taxi driver, along with the 8,000 signups and Morris Blackburn, claimed that Uber's aggressive and illegal launch in Australia caused direct financial losses for taxi and hire car workers. So the class action was brought for these people to seek compensation from Uber for those damages incurred by its unlawful operations. Okay, so it's 2019, a class action is launched. We've got thousands of taxi drivers and hire car drivers claiming that they've lost money because Uber is now in the country. I want to go a little deeper on this idea of Uber operating, in their words, unlawfully. Yeah. Because I think there is a difference between a new competitor entering the transport market and that player then acting anti-competitively or behaving unfairly. Exactly. So it's not illegal for competition in mm. a market. And Uber is such a giant in 2024, it's sort of hard to think about this time when they were kind of the new guy, uncharted territory. And a especially, startup. exactly, a startup. When Uber came to Australia, ride sharing was virtually unheard of. That is compared to a very tightly regulated taxi industry. So talk me through those regulations then. Like, why do you say it's so tightly regulated? Special licenses that are needed, vehicle registration fees, standards for drivers, accreditations that drivers have to meet, that kind of thing. Right. So a heavily regulated space. And then if we think back to more than a decade ago when Uber was really establishing itself in the Australian market, it was basically unregulated, right? Yeah. When Uber rocks up, you know, anyone with a car and a standard driver's license could hypothetically become an Uber driver and start making money tomorrow. So the main argument from this class action was that this wasn't fair and that Uber needed to be regulated. And obviously now things have shifted in the rideshare industry. There are now standards that regulate how ridesharing operates in Australia. But this class action centers on the time before that, and that's when Morris Blackburn is arguing that its clients suffered that financial loss. So even though Uber is a massive part of our lives now, it is important to kind of place it in that context of it still being a real disruptor. Yeah, exactly, which is why I wanted to use an example from 2015, and that was when there was this government review into competition policy. So basically a report that examined certain policies within industries to see if they were being regulated fairly. Right. It's 2015. Mm. We're wearing skinny jeans. Mark Ronson and Bruno Mars' Uptown Funk is playing in every taxi you get in. A government report says that the taxi industry 
is heavily regulated. They said there's a scarcity of taxi licenses, as mentioned, some that cost $400,000 a year, rules that taxis have to operate 365 days a year, that they must accept all reasonable requests and that they must have meters Mm. which set fares and they automate tariffs at certain times and on public holidays. But this 2015 review noted that taxis were being disrupted by tech changes, including, you know, digital booking apps and, of course, ride sharing. At that time, the Taxi Council in Queensland said that taxis and ride sharing were substitutable and should therefore be subject to the same rules. But Uber argued ride sharing does compete with taxis, but that it's not offering taxi services. Well, what do you mean by that? Like, that's an interesting distinction. Ubers are not traditional cabs, right? Hey, I'm James and I edited the video you're watching. If you're enjoying what you're watching, we'd love for you to subscribe so you can stay up to date with all our latest video explainers. Plus, it'll also help us reach new audiences. Thank you so much, and now back to the deep dive. The fundamental differences between taxis and ride sharing are things like ride sharing doesn't accept anonymous rides. You can't hail uh, an Uber in the street. Ride sharing services don't accept any cash. It's all digital, it's all in app. Ride sharing doesn't have ranks and ride sharing services are on demand. And then we get to 2019. Exactly. And that's when Morris Blackburn filed this class action, arguing that Uber and its vehicles and its drivers were able to operate illegally without the proper licenses and accreditations, undercutting the taxi industry, leading to loss of income. And so fast forward a couple of years, and I'm sure many, many, many legal bills. Do we have a sense of why it took so long for them to reach an agreement? This is a quote from Michael Donnelly. He's one of the lawyers at Morris Blackburn who said, Uber fought tooth and nail at every point along the way, every day for five years. And so we have a settlement figure. It's $272 million. That sounds like a lot of cash. Yep, $271.8 million to be precise. And so hypothetically, it should be that there's a pot of money, $272 million. That's split up between the 8,000 people in the case. Is that how it's going to play out? So it's not quite as cut and dry. First off, Morris Blackburn has this agreement with a group called Harbour Fund, and they have paid a proportion of the legal costs of the case over the last five years in exchange for a funding commission. Now that's somewhere between 25 to 30% of this settlement. So it's also entitled to recover its legal costs. And right off the bat, we're looking at you know a minimum of $68 million for that fund. Before we even get to the taxi drivers. Yeah, exactly. And then of course, the law firm will take a commission. Yeah. And then finally, the rest of the settlement will go to the drivers and taxi operators. So we're talking really then about tens of thousands of dollars each, not millions. Yeah. But it is still the fifth largest class action settlement in Australian history. Right. 8,000 people signing up to a class action. That is a huge number of people. We, you know, we see class actions with tens or hundreds of people. This is pretty significant. So they could still end up with tens of thousands of dollars each. And Morris Blackburn said it was proud its team held a major organisation to account for inflicting what it called mass wrongs on people. And have we heard from Uber since the settlement? We did get a statement from Uber this week, which said the platform is now regulated in every state and territory, which kind of speaks to that shift in ride sharing that we mentioned earlier. And it said that since 2018, it's made significant contributions into various state level taxi compensation schemes with the proposed settlement, quote, we put these legacy issues firmly in our past. Is that amount of money going to hurt them? Well, I looked into this because $272 million sounds like a lot of money. But Uber is a global company, as we know, with revenue streams from major countries around the world and not just from ride sharing anymore. They've diversified. Uber Eats is its own beast. Its global revenue for 2023 was over 15 billion Australian dollars. Right. So 9.9 USD. Uh, So, I mean, you've got to think 272 mil will hurt its Australian operation significantly, yeah. but yeah, it's it's a multinational corporation. So, you know, while these proceedings have wrapped up, and I'm sure Uber's very relieved that it's over, 
whether or not it means a lot for their bottom line, we'll kind of have to wait and see. Very interesting, Emma. Thank you. Five stars for you. Uh, and may- maybe I'll add the tip. A bottle of water and some mints for you, Sam. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on The Daily Oz today. If you enjoyed that episode, let us know. If you're in Spotify, you can leave a review or a comment and you can leave a rating if you're on Apple. We'll be back again in your ears tomorrow morning. Until then, have a great day. Bye.